We're going to continue our conversation uh, on, uh, on uh, you know, blockchain and, uh, and Bitcoin uh, with uh, Professor uh, Christian Catalini, uh, who will give an overview, uh, additional uh, details on the economics of blockchain, and actually uh, go into a really fascinating uh, experiment uh, that was done at uh, MIT uh, regarding blockchain. Now, there's so many questions uh, about the use of uh, Bitcoin. You know, is it secure? Can it be hacked? Will it be adopted? Uh, what better laboratory uh, uh, to run an experiment in uh, than having 5,000 MIT uh, geeks go at it. And so we're going to hear a lot more about that and a lot more about the application of, uh, of uh, blockchain. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Simon, for the great introduction to the topic. Um, I'm very much looking forward to give you a preview of the results of this experiment. Uh, you are actually among the first ones to, to see them. Uh, it's an experiment that we launched in 2014, and, and so has evolved over two years along with the technology. But before I start that, uh, I just want to kind of clear um, at the very high level, give you some ideas of how we're thinking about blockchain and why this experiment actually mattered to us. Um, to give you a simple definition, it's imprecise on some of the cryptography, but when you think about blockchain, think about a chain of blocks, okay? <clears throat> and inside those blocks, you can essentially record transactions. And this is where actually things get quite interesting. Those transactions can represent a number of things. It could be an exchange of currency, it could be passing of an IP title, it could be tracking authentication or your identity and what you're able to do in a certain system, uh, which makes this particularly fascinating to economists like me. Because for the first time, we have three fields that are kind of converging. We have, of course, computer science and cryptography. We have the way people like me think about economics and market design, designing marketplaces, how we match demand and supply in different uh, transaction types. And also we think about law, smart contracts, uh, exchanges, and, and the regulation of such. <clears throat> we, we spent a lot of time trying to think about, OK, can we clean out the hype? There's been a lot of discussion in the press about decentralizing every possible market. But as we know, intermediaries add a lot of value in a lot of situations. And at the end, when we tried to really distill the basic economics of the blockchain, we came up with this term. And by the way, we're looking for feedback. Uh, we landed on the word costless verification. We think that the key change that blockchain is able to bring to the economy is reducing the cost of verification at, at a level that's unprecedented. And what's interesting is that we always had verification costs go down. They were almost close to zero. But we always relied on an intermediary. So they were never actually zero. Why is this interesting? Because you can start thinking about everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis as a transaction. You authenticate yourself, you buy something, you exchange on a marketplace, business-to-business uh, -business activities, everything is kind of tracked at the basic entity in a very simple transaction. And some of those attributes are actually quite important. Does the transaction exist? When did it start? The timestamp. Who are the parties involved? Can we certify that those are the parties involved? These attributes matter for how we conduct business every day. Now, things usually run smoothly, and so we don't need to go back to those attributes. But sometimes, and often, there's an exception. And when that happens, we usually perform, at the very high level, something called an audit. We go back and verify those attributes uh, to make sure that things are actually going smoothly, and we can keep delivering the goods or you know, exchanging with the counterparty that, that, that we trust or not. What is changing with blockchain is that that cost of that audit can potentially become zero. And that's where the technology is extremely powerful. The second word is information leakage. The way we solve this problem of costless verification is by leaking our information every time. You open a bank account, you're required to disclose your social security number. Uh, you, you have to show your ID for a number of transactions. And those pieces of information can often be used outside of the original transaction, and that, that has a large cost. That's where, when you think about a technology like Bitcoin, it incubated in markets that are permeated by the absence of trust. If you're buying uh, you know, drugs illegally on the internet, the last thing you want is to leak your personal information. And that's why that technology solved that problem at that stage but it's now moving into much more useful and legitimate uses. And I don't have to remind you of how much information leakage is costing us every day. And this is a growing scale. So this is just the data breaches of the very last months. 
Uh, they're both getting more severe in terms of the amount of data that is disclosed, but also the, the type of information get, that gets leaked. I think at the core, when you think about blockchain, think about the boundaries of the firm. What kind of activities would you rather use the market for versus what kind of activities do you need to keep in-house? This really goes back to Nobel laureate Ronald Coase. He has this theory about the firm versus the market. And I think with blockchain technology, and in particular with costless verification, those boundaries are going to change. Are intermediaries going to disappear? No. Their role will change because some of the parts of their added value will become commoditized. They'll become cheaper. And so intermediaries have to figure out either to move up the value chain and add additional services on top of that or to rethink how they're doing their businesses. So when we got interested in the experiment at MIT, these were some of the applications that we had in mind. Of course, fintech, but also new types of business model that you can do when the cost of verifying that cer certain things have happened or that certain information has been accessed and used or that you're lending or borrowing bandwidth or energy is actually taking place. New types of platforms. You can take businesses like Uber, Netflix, Airbnb, and redesign them on top of a digital currency. There are some advantages. You can increase competition in some of those markets. I think another big part related to the information leakage is identity. Our identity is usually tied to something as simple uh, as a secret or social security number. And hey, you know how weak that link is. Blockchain can track our attributes, what we can do or not do in the economy, in a much more transparent and potentially more secure way. Of course, then there's more, you know, looking, looking forward five, 10 years, you can think about IP, new forms of intellectual property, smart contracts, internet of things, so device kind of bartering and exchanging resources, your car going on the highway and kind of buying up lane space, depending on how fast you need to get to work. Uh, but all of those applications are, are far from here. And that's why in 2014, when two of our students, one MBA from Sloan and one undergraduate student at MIT, decided to give everybody $100 in Bitcoin, uh, we, we got interested. For us, it was a way to learn about the, you know, the technology and the phenomena, and also to potentially get some interesting research insights. They raised the capital by emailing some of our alumni within weeks. Uh, the issue was, though, that there was a very high degree of uncertainty. So roll back the clock. This was before blockchain became kind of a reputable term in the media. Uh, all the press was negative, and it was all about Bitcoin, illegal transactions. Um, some governments were clearly opposed, so there was a risk that you know, high-profile uh, experiment at MIT going wrong could be used as a way to destabilize the, the cryptocurrency. But there were also like some practical concern from ethics. We were essentially dropping half a million dollars of Bitcoin on a very small geographic area. At the same time, the IRS considers Bitcoin property. So we had that conversation with them. Uh, do the students actually need to report it? Uh, they ended up saying, look, it's, it's like chemistry, chemistry materials in a lab. You run the experiment, they'll disappear. Um, <clears throat> so, but it didn't end there. Uh, then the Treasury Office of Counterterrorism Financing. Well, maybe that was a bit overblown. Uh, but we went through all of that. And our basic idea as researcher was like, look, even if everybody cashes out tomorrow, which by the way, that's what many economists would have predicted, partially including me. I gave cash out at a much higher rate than actually uh, we saw. Can we learn something about our students think about security, privacy, trade-offs in, in, in kind of protecting their identity online, leaking the, their information versus not? What choices are they making with a technology that offers a new trade-off? Moreover, remember in 2014, there was absolutely no compelling use case on campus. There were probably 12 restaurants where you could pay in Bitcoin. You could pay and buy books at the MIT coup and convert it into tech cash. We cannot defeat the purpose of using a decentralized currency in the first place. <clears throat> Moreover, we were only seeding one side of the market, the students, not the merchants. We, we literally didn't have the bandwidth to do that. Um, so to give you a sense, well, about 5,000 students uh, were eligible for the study, and we had a lot of educational content. We taught them about PGP, cryptography, digital wallets, how to secure them, trade-offs between you know, a bank-like wallet versus an open source one. Um, and students had to go through that process. So they had to earn their $100 in Bitcoin. Just to give you a feeling, the one on top is kind of an open source wallet. As you can see, it's a bit more clunky. It has way more decimal places than, than you would like to see in a wallet. Uh, the one at the bottom is much more like Venmo, 
or you know, your BOA or, or other bank mobile app. So very simple to use and intuitive and displays amounts in dollars. Our students had five days to get on the waiting list for the experiment. And as you will see, we will use the speed at which they sign up to kind of identify early adopters. So the people that were really more eager to try this technology, which was the basis of one of our first results. First 12 hours into the experiment, of course, right? <laughs> we had a alpha million dollar jackpot, and we have some of the smartest students on the planet uh, trying to find it. Uh, luckily, we went really low tech on that. The money was never on a server. Uh, it was actually transported on a USB stick through Boston in a backpack. Um, <laughs> But that, that didn't work out. So uh, we called up the student. I was like, stop trying. We planned for this. Uh, <laughs> then there were things we didn't plan for. Uh, this is 24 hours in. And, and this is, I think, to Bill Zolet, efforts on campus to encourage entrepreneurship. One startup realized that this was a great way to sign up customers. So they impersonated us and tried to steer traffic to their website. Uh, so that's something we hadn't planned for just to give you a sense of how things evolve when you're running at this scale. Even at MIT, only about 6% of our students were very or extremely familiar with Bitcoin. So again, this is 2014, and it's a technology that's hard to use. About half of our sample had to send us their Bitcoin wallet more than once um, because they had problems with it. And this was interesting. So when we asked them what draws you to Bitcoin, 35% said, I want to buy them as an investment. And in the sign-up, actually, we were using some of the document from uh, CFPB. And um, the idea was, like, can we make it clear to the students that it's a speculative asset, the value is very volatile, they should not put their savings on it. And then we see that answer. So we got a little bit worried, mostly because we distributed Bitcoins at $350 um, at, at distribution day. And then the price kind of started dropping over 200 Turns out they were right. So the value uh, is now over $600. So students doubled um, their original amount, the ones that kept holding. But let me give you kind of a really quick snapshot of what happened. And um, again, some of this uh, defied my own expectations on how many of them would cash out. 70% of our students went through the sign up and decided to participate in the study. Uh, even as of today, 47% is still holding onto their Bitcoin. They haven't touched them, they haven't used them, they're just keeping them for something. Um, activity has been fairly low. Think about between 14 and 20%, depending on how you define it. And initial cash out for the first month was only like 11%. Most people were holding on to them. And, and as of today, about 40% of them went back to the US dollar. Here you're looking kind of at the map of cash out. And for those of you familiar with the dorms, uh, you can see that the East Campus has a much higher cash out rate. Um, but also our activity. So the green dots here are showing you the activity across campus and for students that are not on campus. If you look at the overall level of transaction, we went from about you know, 50 to maybe 100 transactions per week. So really small numbers. Um, again, the use cases are, are fairly limited. And I think students are more thinking about the kind of application that I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, that, that will require further R&D. In our first paper on the experiment, we really ask a, a, a kind of a question related to Bitcoin, but to fintech, I think, in general, which is, can you really accelerate the early stages of technology adoption? So that's very low tax. That's hybrid corn. Uh, and those curves, it's a famous paper by Zvi Grilikas, looks at the diffusion of hybrid corn across US states. So if you ask economists, why do we see kind of this S-shaped curve? They would typically tell you that, well, people have different marginal benefit and marginal cost of you know, adopting a technology. At the beginning, the costs are high, so you only see a few people that have the highest return. And as the costs go down and diffusion happens, you see the classic S-shaped diffusion curve. Now, what's interesting about these diffusion curves is that economists tend to think of them as a fact of nature. But then when we go in an MBA class and teach managers, we say, OK, you should strategically try to manipulate that curve and accelerate your path through it. Uh, a clear example of this was when Google, with Glass, decided to go first to the fashion outlets and skip kind of the more nerdy developer crowd in an effort to make the product uh, something that the regular consumers would want. As many of you know, that effort uh, totally backfired. So it turns out we know very little about technology diffusion curve. We know they're present everywhere. Uh, there's, it's one of the most robust findings in economics, in marketing, in sociology. Um, 
But we can't really explain well why certain technologies diffuse very rapidly. And of course, over time, they're diffusing more and more rapidly. Uh, and why some may take centuries. So the cure, cure for scurvy took more than 200 years. And when you think about the consequences, it's kind of uh, appealing that uh, it took so long for something that was that useful to, to reach adoption. Uh, if you look at Pokemon Go, that was about two weeks. Uh, it's a very quick diffusion curve. Now, the challenge on understanding if you can actually accelerate technology adoption is that we never get to see the counterfactual. So we see the way technology diffuses, but we can never see a kind of a parallel world where that diffusion took a different trajectory. Uh, that's a key challenge when we do research on this question because uh, essentially we, we can't really trust the results that we get from observational data. And again, I think the irony is that when we think about theories of technology diffusion and adoption, often you're, you're taught to cross the chasm and to kind of manipulate and strategically play this diffusion curve in a way that's advantageous to your firm. Uh, but we don't really have the data to, to inform that decision in, in the first place. Why is this research question particularly challenging? Well, first, rarely we get to see when people adopt or disadopt a certain technology at, you know, at the time level uh, that, that we would need. Moreover, if we really want to ask the counterfactual question of like, what if this other group of people had adopted first, we need to be able to say what the natural early adopters are before we seed the technology into the market. Today, it's very easy to identify early adopters for Apple products because they're probably all in line at the Apple store unless they woke up early at midnight. So what this experiment actually allowed us to do is to use the Bitcoin and the blockchain to track adoption and disadoption of Bitcoin in a context where we were able to identify early Bitcoin adopters. These were people that had a passion for fintech, uh, were more likely to use Venmo and all sorts of uh, other payments, uh, mobile payments apps uh, that interestingly place more trust in startups than you know, the government or a known carrier or a known financial intermediary for their financial services. So they're kind of the, the natural crowd for something like this. And then what we do is we randomize. Think of it as the classic medical treatment and placebo experiment where some students will get Bitcoin right away and some will have to wait for two weeks. So what happened here is that 50% of our sample, half of, half of MIT students, had to wait for, for two extra weeks. And we didn't tell them kind of when they would receive it. But what's interesting here is that some of the people that really wanted it, that were eager to, to adopt Bitcoin, had to wait for two weeks. And this is just a small difference in timing. Are those people that sign up first more likely to be early adopters? Uh, I don't have the time to go into the details, but again, on their personality traits and on what they do, they're way more uh, fintech oriented. So they're, they're kind of the sample that we'd want. Let me give you a preview of the first result. So when we delayed people that were natural early adopters, they were more than twice as likely to cash out their Bitcoin, to abandon it. And what's interesting is that this actually has an effect on the overall disadoption curve. So here you're seeing the yellow line that's falling much more rapidly than the blue line. Those are people in groups, in social clusters, where a disproportionate share of early adopters was delayed. When you compare this at the end of our sample, students that kind of were delayed with early adopters uh, in their peer group were 54% less likely to be active. So a big gap in how active the communities were on a daily basis uh, using Bitcoin. So why does delaying natural early adopters really slow down diffusion? Why, why, why is that true? So the classic explanation is it's about learning. These people teach others how to use Bitcoin, and so by delaying them, they can show their friends, they can teach them that. Um, and that's a very plausible explanation. Economists call that usually pure effects in learning. I'll show you a few of the stories that we can rule out. First of all, it's not about being financially constrained. It's not that they just wanted $100 more uh, than the others, so we can rule that out. It's also not that they had a better sense of how the Bitcoin price would evolve. As you know, the price is highly volatile, so no difference in that. Uh, they didn't have different preferences for risk or investment. Um, we can throw out anybody that used Bitcoin before in case they, they were kind of acting differently than the others. And what's interesting is that this effect is coming from the dorms. So from spaces where the students are very likely to be socialized with each other. Moreover, this behavior is driven by small dorms. So places where the fact that I'm delayed and you're not is potentially very visible uh, to each other. 
It gets stronger when these early adopters are more rare. They're likely to be one of the few technology gatekeepers and kind of a reference technologist for their peers. Here's the slide that rules out learning. Because of the experiment, some clusters of friends were all delayed. Everybody had to wait for two weeks. So you can think of this group as a group that was shifted by two weeks on their adoption clock. So their S curve, their diffusion curve, was starting two weeks later. Early adopters are way more likely to abandon Bitcoin even when everybody is delayed. It is really something about their, their kind of identity and reputation with, within their community. So what are the key takeaways from our first study? Well, first of all, and this, I mean, for some may be obvious, is that delaying early adopters has a really negative effect on this adoption. Now, while this may seem obvious, how many times a firm rolls out a product without having identified their early adopters first, right? So there could be settings where the adoption process is actually suboptimal. We're leaving money on the table. Moreover, their disadoption has strong negative effects on their friends, on their peers. The way we've conceptualized this is really about the exclusivity period. Early adopters get utility, they get value from being first and from adopting that technology at an early stage. Again, think about the lines at the Apple store this morning. So when you take that away, that reduces the value that will, they will overall uh, get from the technology. For the managers, uh, I think this shows that actually it's very hard to manipulate that diffusion curve. In a sense, economists were right. There's a natural order to adoption, and it really backfires to try to manipulate it. You could accelerate it within the curve, but if you're trying to kind of jump up around from, from one segment to the other, that could be really negative. Uh, you can download the full paper at blockchain.mit.edu, and um, I'll thank you, and I'll open up for questions. Hi, so my question is, how is this going to address the, uh, the global issue of cross-border, um, you know, that we see and slows down the whole processes? Do you think that is going to uh, uh, disrupt that? Yeah, so very good point. I, I think when you think about payment rails, uh, some are more efficient than others. And, and as Simon was saying, I think one of the features of blockchain is that it's really lowering the cost of transferring secure information from A to B. Uh, so when you think about the remittance market, uh, if you transfer money from South Africa to Mozambique, that, that, that cut is about 20%. Uh, of course, there's some last mile costs. So many people still like to use you know, the Western Union shop. Uh, so that's not going to change. But at the same time, that market is, is fairly uncompetitive. Uh, it's more competitive if you look at online products that allow you to transfer money online. Those are around 2 and 3%. Uh, but I think the answer to your question broadly defined is yes. Um, there's a way you can you know, take capital from one country to the other. In, in some of the new research projects we're working on, uh, this is an example in Kenya, what we're doing is we're trying to connect students that are trying to pay uh, for their school fees uh, to kind of a remittance market. Uh, so you could have people that are abroad or even people that are family and friends now get a verified proof that that money is actually flowing to nothing else but the school fees. So I think there's very interesting application in this space. Okay. I just want to applaud you and MIT for having the courage to conduct an experiment with no business case. That took guts and thank you for sharing this information. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the fact that I'm here is that the experiment actually turned out to be useful, but yeah. <laughs> Ready? I can tell you that many people didn't agree with me at that stage. Over here. Thank you. Over here. Um, sorry for the technical question, but I'm over to your right. Uh, there, right there. Nope, too much. Um, so if, if, you're, oh, long, if, sorry. You're, if yes. you're long on blockchain infrastructure, aren't you necessarily short on quantum computing? I assume RSA is underneath. So with RSA, with quantum computing, you can um, factor quickly and there goes your RSA encryption. Yeah, I think if RSA encryption falls apart, we have much bigger problems than blockchain at this point. But um, I think it's a fair point. And um, the market design of this digital currency is, is evolving continuously, right? So the reason why Bitcoin uses proof of work uh, it's because it was designed to be resilient and distributed and non-censorship. Uh, um, essentially, nobody can censor Bitcoin transaction. And so those computations kind of create the incentives. Uh, I think computer scientists 
tend to overrate how much the cryptography matters. I think it's, it's kind of greed. The mining process is secure because there's a sunk investment. If cryptography becomes different, I think you could change that part of the protocol to implement something more secure. But yes, that's, that's a concern. Hi, question over here to your left. Thank you. So your results indicated that only 20% or so or less of your participants were actually active and you had no a priori identified use cases, if you will. Did you have any learnings regarding use cases which evolved out of the uh, observed participants? Yeah, so many of our students are international and we're still kind of working on follow-on papers where we look at some of the questions like, like the one you're highlighting. Uh, we've seen some cross-border money flows. Uh, we've seen some online shopping. We've seen some experiments, so people pooling and crowdfunding things online. Uh, many of our students are trading. Uh, so when you see activity, uh, it's only 14%, but that 14%, some of them are crazily active you know, exchanging Bitcoin for Ethereum and back and forth and, and all of that. Um, some of the things we also looked at is their choices in terms of privacy because when we offer them the different digital wallets, they could choose, again, the more bank-like wallet like Coinbase or Circle, or they could compile their own code and run, you know, the fully open source and totally decentralized uh, Electrum. Um, and it turns out that most of our students went for convenience. So when you're kind of worried about AML and KYC, it turns out that students are very happy to give up, you know, part of their information uh, for a better user experience. Uh, just a logistical question. Uh, are these papers going to be available to us uh, to download somewhere? Absolutely. Somehow, so uh, at blockchain.mit.edu, we have the first paper out. Right. And uh, I mean, academia moves at a slow pace, but we'll have one on the economics of the blockchain. Right. I, I, I guess I'm just talking about overall all the papers from today. I mean, will, how will they be available easily? I assume or? so, yeah. Well, I guess I can. Hi, um, do you have any plans uh, for like a round two? And if so, have you thought about um, coming up with ways to incentivize the early adopters to, um, you know, not right. push it, but uh, yeah. Promote? So round two was actually, and here's a interesting insight was uh, was supposed to happen. The, so we did it in the fall. It was supposed to happen right in the spring at Stanford. Uh, it didn't work out at Stanford. So the students were trying to push their own wallet. Uh, very much in driving adoption to their startup, and so we never replicated at Stanford. Uh, I don't think there's any plans to repeat anytime soon. Uh, again, we're still processing what we learned so far before doing any other uh, research study of that type. Just a quick uh, request for you to sort of expound more on how will the role of intermediaries change over time? Um, you clearly said they won't go away, but probably their role will morph over time. Can you spend a couple of minutes talking about that? Yes, and I think Simon was um, hinting at this also as he started talking about central banks. Um, whenever you enable costless verification, that kind of audit loop that was on the slide it's commoditized, right? So we don't need the intermediary to do that anymore. Uh, of course, intermediaries do many more interesting things. Uh, I'll give you an example. When we think about Uber, Uber matches drivers, right, with consumers. Uh, and the big part of the certification there is certifying the drivers and the cars. Uh, but you could imagine a world where a digital currency does the matching on the two sides of the market, and many companies compete for the certification services. So essentially, Uber becomes a protocol, um, and you have multiple sites competing for that. Um, so, I think when you think about intermediation, you should ask yourself how much of that intermediary is just doing verif verification for, for either side. Um, a, a key additional nugget on that is that many platforms online are essentially giant trustworthy reputation systems. So when you think about Yelp, um, turns out that the digital currency is a great way to build a reputation system too because it's based on verified purchases, very much like some of the Amazon reviews. You could see that you know, someone has purchased the service and, and, and that's kind of feedback into the, into the reputation of the seller. Uh, so I think those are kind of interesting questions, but again, it will take some time to, to unfold. Last question. I'm just curious, in the industry as a whole, there's a very small, finite set of core code and protocols. Do you know of anybody working on 
a new core code or new protocols? I think every day, and that's kind of the fascinating part. Uh, Simon was hinting at how, yes, Bitcoin seems to be kind of the leading standard for a lot of this. But what's interesting, I think, from a market design perspective is that some of the choices on, on basic economics of the Bitcoin protocol make it really adapt for certain applications and not others. So I think what you will see is competition around this different digital currencies for different uses. Um, so there's protocols that are trying to implement real anonymity, uh, which have good and very bad implications, uh, because again, Bitcoin is pseudonymous, as was mentioned before. There's protocols trying to focus on applications like Ethereum. There's protocols trying to you know, focus on security. Um, I think we, we live in an interesting time where uh, sometimes we may settle on a standard just because it's well diffused. Um, at the broader level, I think there needs to be a conversation between firms, academia, and developers uh, in, in building a standard for this and, and kind of bringing this to the market in a way that's potentially uh, efficient like the you know, IETF did for many of the internet standards. Thank you very much.